Hello and welcome to Metal Floss Video. Today we're going to be talking about space. We're going to learn about failed attempts to explore planets like Venus and Mars. We're going to explore some weird things that have been brought into space, like lots of Legos for instance. And we're going to look at the future of space travel. Let's get started. talking about all the cool stuff we know about space, let's talk about what we've failed to learn. Sometimes attempts to explore the universe haven't gone so well. Like Pioneer E, which was a solar orbiter launched in the US in 1969. It was one of five similar orbiters that was built to start orbiting the sun to study things like solar wind and cosmic dust. Unfortunately, unlike the four before it, Pioneer E never made it to orbit. Here's what happened in the words of Charlie Hall, a project manager and researcher on the project. Ten seconds before the end of the first stage burn, the rocket hydraulic pump went out and we lost control of the direction of the rocket. We have pictures of that thing turning around 270 degrees, and after the turn, the second stage separated. So the second stage went off to the right and the first stage fell down into the Atlantic Ocean. They blew up the launch vehicle, but we tracked the spacecraft all the way into the Atlantic Ocean. Back around the same time, Time, the USSR made some major strides in exploring Venus, but some of those great accomplishments would end in failures. For instance, the Venera 1 became the first spacecraft to ever fly past Venus in 1961. Unfortunately, communication had already been lost with it, so no data was sent. And the Venera 3 was the first time human-made technology touched another planet, but no data was sent from it either due to another communication issue. They also had some lens cap issues with the Veneras 9 through 12. Two lens caps were supposed to be removed during each mission to take pictures of Venus. Sometimes only one separated, other times both caps stayed on. I can't tell you how many times that's happened to me, right? Lens cap. NASA had a Venus failure too, with the Mariner 1. It was launched to fly past Venus in 1962, but within five minutes it had to be commanded to self-destruct. You may know this story as the time NASA omitted a hyphen in computer code, causing an $18,500,000 mistake. But it was actually probably something called an overbar that was left out, leading to calculation mistakes and Mariner 1 going off course. Which may remind you of NASA's Mars Climate Orbiter from the late 1990s. It was a satellite sent to monitor weather on the planet, but when it reached Mars's atmosphere, it disappeared. There was conflicting information in the system, namely one piece of software was providing information in pounds while another was expecting it in newtons. Also in the late 1990s, Japan's Nozami, meaning hope, went into space. The goal was to take pictures of Mars and to study the planet's upper atmosphere and magnetic field. And for a few years, it did provide lots of good information about space. But it was never able to make it into Mars's orbit due to some technical and propellant issues. So instead, it was put into solar orbit, where it remains to this day. And Europeans were trying to get into the Mars exploration game too. Their Beagle 2 landed on the planet in 2003, but never communicated back. Then in 2015, pictures from NASA's Mars Reconnaissance Orbiter identified the Beagle 2. It was near its landing target after all, but it had four solar panels and they weren't all able to open. It may have still been trying to send data though. According to its mission manager Mark Sims in 2016, it may have worked for hundreds of days depending on how much dust was deposited on the solar panels and whether any dust devils were cleaning the panels. One possibility is that it could still be working today, but it is extremely unlikely and I doubt that it is. Scott Kelly spent about a year on the International Space Station, and before that, we already knew some of what time in space could cause in humans, like declining eyesight, atrophied muscles, even brittle bones. But it's nice to know more, especially if NASA eventually wants to send someone on a three-year journey to Mars, for instance. So Scott Kelly and his identical twin brother Mark suggested a study in which Mark could act as the control because he stayed on Earth while Scott was on the space station. NASA had researchers give proposals and they chose 10 investigations. You may have heard of this study because in early 2018, word spread that Mark and Scott were no longer identical twins because 7% of Scott's DNA had changed in space. To be clear though, 
That was not true. A person who went through 7% DNA alteration would no longer be a person. What changed was Scott's gene expression levels. So to take you back to your biology class, DNA is the building block of much of life. It can be found in cells that make up our bodies, and it was the genes inside Scott's DNA that had a different expression after his trip to space. This basically means his body was using his genes differently while he was up there, and that kind of thing isn't super uncommon. And gene expression changes have been observed due to all kinds of benign stuff, like for instance a diet change. But it's interesting that 7% of those stayed altered even after he'd been back on Earth for months. It doesn't mean, however, that he and Mark are no longer twins. If I learned anything from the eponymous Arnold Schwarzenegger Danny DeVito movie, it's that once you're a twin, you're always a twin. There were a bunch of other things being studied besides non-existent DNA alteration, like the researchers noticed that Scott had an increase in cytokines for six months after his mission ended, which is a sign of inflammation. They also observed that he ended up with less speed and accuracy right after getting back, which could have been due to a number of factors, like the change of gravity, for instance. And they were differences in his collagen, blood clotting, and bone formation. But in general, it's hard to draw sweeping conclusions from this research. Mark and Scott Kelly's lives were so different that you can't just extrapolate one aspect. Plus, we're talking about an experiment of just two people, and the whole thing isn't even over yet. More information will be made available later this year, so we'll see what else we learn. It's not all serious experiments happening up in space either. Some weird things have made it up there over the years. Like the guy who discovered Pluto is in space. Clyde Tombaugh discovered the planet, back then it was, you know, considered one, in 1930 and died in 1997. And some of his ashes were put on the New Horizons spacecraft in 2006, which reached Pluto in July of 2015. In 1972, Charles Duke walked on the moon and left something behind, a picture of his family. On the back it read, this is the family of astronaut Duke from planet Earth, landed on the moon April 1972. Astronaut Garrett Reisman was a Yankees fan, a really big one, so bringing a Yankees banner to the International Space Station in 2008 wasn't enough for him. He also had dirt from the pitcher's mound at Yankee Stadium and a hat signed by the team's principal owner, George M. Steinbrenner. Luke Skywalker's lightsaber handle has been to space. The prop went to the ISS in 2007 in honor of the first film's 30th anniversary. In the past, astronauts had brought smaller personal Star Wars related toys too. It turns out, astronauts like space. Who knew? And speaking of toys, Satoshi Furukawa brought Legos to the ISS in 2012. He went on to put together a Lego ISS, Mars rover, and Hubble Space Telescope while he was up in space. I guess they're just getting bored up there. Finally, in 1965, an astronaut named John Young brought a corned beef sandwich with him to a five-hour mission on the Gemini 3. NASA was just starting to experiment with non-tube-based meals, so sandwiches were very much against the rules. All turned out fine, but bread is still discouraged on the ISS because of the problems crumbs can cause. They could fly fly into equipment like an electrical panel or ventilation filter, or they could end up in an astronaut's eye or mouth, which is a choking hazard, but come on, they're delicious. Given that bread and space go together terribly, you may be wondering how astronauts can enjoy delicious sandwiches, because we all need those. Well, they don't. Sandwiches are often made with tortillas, which is convenient because A, no crumbs, and B, you can carry them with one hand. Some astronauts in the past ate bread covered in gelatin. But in October of 2016, a man in the industry and his engineer friend wanted to change that. They knew that there's really nothing like fresh bread, and they wanted astronauts to have that. So they founded a company called Bake in Space, headquartered in Germany at that point. Their goal is to figure out a way to let astronauts bake bread on the ISS. As they put it on their website in 2017, in order to improve astronauts' well-being on long-duration missions, such as on a moon base or on Mars, food plays an essential key role. Besides a source for nutrition, the smell of fresh bread evokes memories of general happiness and is an important psychological factor. My belly is proof for that. Go carbs. This idea of bringing astronauts comfort via nourishment has also led to growing vegetables in space. There was also the ISS Espresso experiment in which a special espresso machine was designed for the space station. But this bread making project won't be easy. One restriction is that the oven itself can only use about a tenth of the power of our regular Earth ovens. That means a longer bake time, which dries out bread. And preheating isn't an option. If a hot oven was opened on the space station, it could result in a hot air bubble outside of the oven, which might burn someone on board. Plus, the bread should have no crumbs and be pretty fluffy. Or 
at least not hard, to stay true to the company's mission of creating a happy comfort food in space. They wanted to conduct initial experiments with Alexander Gerst, who headed to the space station in 2018. They weren't quite ready in time, so they're looking ahead to 2020 or 2021 for their first attempts. Thanks for watching Metal Floss Video, which is made with the help of all of these nice people. If you'd like to see upcoming Scatterbrained episodes, don't forget to subscribe. Thank you again for watching, and DFTBA.